Yes, so I think we can start with the first lecture, which will be from Dr. Khanna. So Dr. Gupta, for your information, there is a, there was a swapping of the lectures between Dr. Gupta and Dr. Khanna. So Dr. I Gupta's see. talk has already been done, and uh, now it will be Dr. Khanna's talk. Yeah. Good. good. Uh, so, yes. Dr. So, Rajiv Gupta, you can start the first one. Yes. yes. Dr. So, N. N. Khanna. Yes. So, Dr. N. N. Khanna. I am uh, glad to introduce Dr. N. N. Khanna to the August gathering. And Dr. N. N. Khanna is not a new figure in cardiology, not only in India, but in UAE also, because he has been with us earlier in the conferences and he has huge experiences, a huge experience in cardiology, both in non-invasive and invasive cardiology in focus. And uh, he works in the prestigious Apollo Indraprasth Hospital at New Delhi. In addition to his clinical liability, he is quite actively involved in the academics and the registries and writing papers and presenting many uh, in the many conferences and the meetings. And uh, without taking much time, I invite Dr. N. N. Khanna to present his talk. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I thank Dr. Brijesh uh, for inviting me to this wonderful meeting, the Sheikh Heart 2022. Actually, uh, I'm called for an emergency case. I may not be able to join, so I'm recording my presentation. The title of the presentation is Immediate and Long-Term Management of VTE and Pulmonary Embolism. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take you to the risk factors, uh, the immediate uh, goals and the long-term goals and the management for uh, VTE and pulmonary embolism. Now, just to uh, put things in the right perspective, VTE actually uh, encompasses it, acute deep vein thrombosis, which is DVT and pulmonary embolism. And together they are known as VTE. Now, uh, the risk factors could be idiopathic or uh, the presentation could be just primary DVT, which increases with age and uh, also with association of cancer, residual thrombus from previous DVT, male gender and uh, genetic tendencies of thrombophilia actually account for high incidence of DVT in a particular cohort of patients. It is the leading cause of death worldwide and it is estimated that there are more than 500,000 deaths every year in Europe because of VTE alone and an estimated 3 lakhs VTE related deaths uh, in US every year. It is estimated to cause at least 3 million deaths a year worldwide and this is the map you can see worldwide. We have a small study from CMC Valor in India. This was done from 1996 to 2005. And the incidence of VTE was 17.46 per uh, 10,000 admissions. And among the risk factors, malignancy accounted for 31% and was the most common predisposing factor followed by post-operative status. The incidence following surgery was 5 per 10,000 operations uh, and was highest. Uh, general surgery patients had the highest incidence of deep vein thrombosis while the incidence in orthopedic patients were about 20.1%. Uh, Pulmonary embolism was diagnosed in 14.9% of the study population and the mortality in those with confirmed pulmonary embolism was 13.5%. VT is no longer a reality in India and it continues to be suspected more often than it is diagnosed and it is prudent to actually have a very high index of suspicion and to treat them uh, as and when required uh, pro proactively then uh, counteractively. Now coming on to the specific goals uh, of VTE, the specific goals are prevention of embolization to the lung, prevention of extension to larger veins, uh, that means the proximal extension, then to prevent recurrence and avoid complications of DVT. Now in VTE, uh, the conventional anticoagulation treatment was the treatment and it uh, involves uh, treatment of acute phase, recurrent prevention and extended use and I'm going to be discussing about it in the future slides. Uh, 
Initially, the treatment would be heparin or low molecular weight heparin for at least five days, followed by uh, anti oral anticoagulation, which could be vitamin K antagonist maintaining an INR of two to three, or uh, uh, extended use of VK and maintaining the same INR of two to three for three, three months to indefinitely. Now, in this uh, acute phase, recurrent prevention and uh, extended phase. Now we also have wonderful group of drugs called the NOAX and I'm going to be subsequently uh, telling you about this. VKA alone takes too long to provide VTE, uh, to provide anticoagulation in VTE patients. That is why initially it's prudent to use heparin or low molecular weight heparin for two to four days. And uh, after this, we convert them to VKA therapy or NOAC therapy. In 2014, the ESC PE guidelines actually had a class one recommendation for, for PE, unprovoked PE, uh, uh, treating them with uh, heparin and anticoagulation for at least three months. And also for NOAX, uh, which could be either rivaroxaban, apexaban, or dabigatran, and also endoxan uh, for uh, treatment in the initial phase. All of them had a class of recommendation, which was one and level of evidence, which was B. Now, uh, in 2016, ACCP uh, guidelines for VT antithrombotic therapy, initial anticoagulation was again preferred and it has uh, uh, class, uh, class one and class two recommendation as was the same with ESC 2019 guidelines. So there is no question that anticoagulation remains the mainstay of treatment in VT in acute stage. And there are different drugs. We have vitamin K antagonist and we have NOAX. And in NOAX, we have these four drugs. I'm not going to be going to the pharmacology of these NOAX, but uh, we know that they're all very safe drugs. And uh, Apixaban actually uh, has the lowest major bleeding complication. Now, in patients where we actually want to uh, prevent post thrombotic complications or where the risk of uh, from, I mean, uh, pulmonary embolism is high or if there is a pulmonary embolism with cartogenic shock or the uh, VT happens despite uh, oral anticoagulation therapy, it is much prudent to have an early clot removal by uh, thrombectomy or thrombolysis. And this has now become a, a higher class of treatment in patients with acute DVT. It prevents post-thrombotic syndrome and a catheter-directed thrombolysis for deep vein thrombosis was uh, studied in, in Kevin, three, uh, Kevin trial and it has a follow-up of five years. It was an open level randomized controlled trial. Now, there could be an endovascular treatment, uh, which is now mostly restricted to uh, or, uh, you know, specialized to pharmacoinvasive therapy where we isolate a segment of uh, thrombus and then uh, do a lysis and do a thrombectomy for the same. Now, pharmacomechanical catheter based thrombolysis, we have different dedicated devices. I'm not going to go to the detail of these specific devices, but the concept is that you isolate a segment of the thrombus, acute thrombus, and then lyse this or pulverize it, and then uh, take out this thrombus from uh, the vein segment by segment. This works very well and it leads to a rapid. Uh, thrombus removal from in acute patients of DVT. And this leads to a prevention of valvular function, a preservation of valvular function, and also preventing post-thrombotic syndrome. Now, a little uh, talk about IVC filters. They are contraindicated <coughs> in patients where there is, uh, you know, where the patients have infection and the uh, compliance is poor, but it is indicated only in patients where anticoagulation has failed or there is a very high risk of acute pulmonary embolism because of proximal or proximal IVC, ILEX or proximal IVC uh, thrombus. And uh, there is no doubt that now the IVC filters have to be put. They should be put only temporarily and should be taken out as early as possible because of the uh, uh, concomitant uh, complications which could be thrombus formation itself or gut perforation or I, uh, IVC perforation. Now this is uh, very important and where it should be used the thrombolytic therapy or thrombectomy therapy should be used uh, in proximal EVT not distal EVT and IVC filter should be used.
interest in uh, proximal and IBC, proximal IBC DVDs and uh, should be taken out as early as possible. So I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, there, these are different details of, uh, you know, uh, taking out uh, the proximal DVT by thrombectomy devices. What we need to understand is that DVT, once a DVT uh, is there, there is a high risk of secondary DVT unless the entire clot is taken out. There is a very good study that if you have more than 10% residual clot, the subsequent DVT risk is very high. It also depends whether the patient has provoked or unprovoked DVT. Prognosis in, and recurrence in provoked DVT is much less as compared to unprovoked DVT. Now, there is an ESC consensus statement on extended management, and it is based on balancing risk factors of recurrence against bleeding risk, and it is preferred as the first-line anticoagulation therapy in uh, non-cancer patients. So, in, if you have DVT which is unprovoked, uh, you should act, actually continue with long-term anticoagulation. In provoked DVT, especially the distal DVTs, the anticoagulation should be for three months. And in patients where you have uh, unprovoked DVTs with high risk of uh, 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 thrombotic complications like in cancer patients or in patients with uh, genetic thrombophilia, these patients require lifelong uh, management with uh, anticoagulation therapy, which is usually NOAX or VKA. Uh, now, there are some special uh, conditions, especially during pregnancy, L low molecular weight is uh, recommended for the initial or for the long-term treatment, while in cancer patients, uh, we use it for uh, prophylaxis as well. Now, this is one of our patients who had an acute DVT. You can see it on an angiogram. And what we used is the a pharmacoinvasive therapy. We started, uh, we did a popliteal stick, got a sheath in, uh, took out the thrombus, did a pharmacoinvasive thrombolysis, and this is the final result which we got. And you can see uh, these, these are the type of clots which are taken out. Now we use uh, mechanical uh, thrombectomy devices and also we use aspiration thrombectomy devices like uh, the penumbra or uh, angel jet. This is our experience of 976 venous limbs in 911 patients in the last seven years. The duration of DVT was one uh, day to two weeks and uh, we did uh, thrombolytic therapy alone in 286 patients, pharmaco mechanical, ther mechanical therapy in 637 limbs, mechanical thrombectomy and aspiration in 531 limbs. PTA alone in 143 limbs and PTA with stand in 138 limbs. And what you can see here is that there was a complete resolution of this acute DVT in 638 limbs. And there was post-thrombotic uh, complications only in 43 limbs. All the patients had uh, oral anticoagulation therapy. Only one had pulmonary embolism. And the recurrence was only seen in 37 patients. Now, with this uh, background of uh, DVT and acute management and long-term management, let me shift gears to pulmonary embolism. We have already discussed the epidemiology. What is very important is there are risk factors, and the risk factors for uh, DVT are the same as that for uh, uh, DVT leading to pulmonary embolism, which comprises of endothelial damage, hypercoagulability, and stasis. Once we have a patient of acute DVT, uh, PE, we actually see whether the patient is in shock or not in shock. If the patient is in shock or hypotension, it's classified as high-risk DVT. Uh, B. If there is no shock or hypotension, it is classified as low-risk uh, P. It's very clear that uh, once you have a high suspicion of uh, DVT, um, DVT leading to pulmonary embolism, you take these patients for CT angiography and bedside echocardiography. Uh, on the CTVC thrombosis in the main pulmonary artery, branch arteries and distal segmental arteries. And in the uh, echo, what we see is we look for RV dysfunction, RV dilatation, and uh, in the labs, we look for uh, raise, I mean, rise in anti-pro BNP and also in cardiac enzymes, especially the troponin I. Once we establish the diagnosis of uh, uh, acute PE uh, on the basis of uh, clinical suspicion, lab test, echo test, and CT angio. And, we, and once we try them into a low risk and high risk PE, a low risk PEs are treated uh, uh, uniformly by uh, initial bolus of unfractionated heparin, uh, 80 units per kg or 5,000 units. 
or low molecular weight heparin followed by oral anticoagulant therapy with vitamin A, vitamin A antagonist therapy or NOAX. Uh, while high risk uh, uh, pulmonary embolisms are treated by again uh, high doses of unfractionated heparin or thrombolytic therapy and or surgical pulmonary embolectomy depending on the clinical condition of the patient and all of this according to the ESC consensus recommendation have class 1 indication. Thrombolysis, we can use either of the thrombolytic agents, streptokinase, urokinase and RTPA. Streptokinase is uh, not a clot fibrin selective agent so that the dose is high and the uh, results are inferior as compared to urokinase and RTPA. And the standard treatment is urokinase 4,400 units per kg as a loading dose over 10 minutes followed by 4,400 kg units per kg per hour over 12 to 24 hours. If you are using TPA, we infuse 100 milligram over two hours or 0.6 milligram per kg over 15 minutes. Surgical embolectomy is reserved uh, for patients who do not respond uh, to conventional treatment and are in uh, cardiogenic shock. Otherwise, uh, if, if the better therapy would be a uh, catheter-based uh, pulmonary thrombectomy, which we are doing routinely and which should be done if the devices are available. There have been a prospective single arm multicenter trial on ultrasound facilitated catheter directed low dose fibrinolysis for acute massive and submassive pulmonary embolism. This was the Seattle 2 study and it showed that uh, the ultrasound facilitated uh, catheter directed low dose fibrinolysis decreased RV dilatation, reduced. There was 10 per this study and that's why uh, we cannot go and take it uh, uh, universally and there is always a choice whether we treat these patients in this way or by conventional thrombolytic therapies. Uh, we have a small study which on percutaneous pul pulmonary thrombectomy and thrombolysis for B. This is our personal experience of 45 patients. And what we have done here is we have uh, taken the patients in the cat lab, we have pulverized the thrombus with the help of a 035 guide wire and we have uh, given, um, taken out the thrombus by a thrombosuction catheter and which is uh, 9 French or 10 French in, um, in um, profile and then uh, we put in two multipurpose catheters with multiple side holes and infused uh, tissue plasminogen activator and uh, complete the thrombolysis. Actually, this is a very rewarding procedure. We, we had a success uh, as defined by 50% drop in the pulmonary artery pressure, significant improvement in SpO2 and 50% reduction in clot burden in 44 out of 45 patients. There is also a similar uh, ESC consensus statement on the use of uh, NOAX and anticoagulation or thrombectomy in acute pulmonary embolism depending on the acute phase of the disease and the clinical presentation. It is seen that NOAX as an initial treatment in acute treatment of BT is uh, beneficial and uh, actually leads to a, a risk uh, benefit ratio in terms of treating these patients of acute uh, BT and pulmonary embolism is always their bleeding risk. Now closed uh, monitoring is recommended in patients with intermediate or high risk PE and, and uh, the hemodynamic decom uh, decompensation is a phenomena which may happen and that is why these patients have to be treated with a, a team which comprises of uh, interventional cardiologists, uh, respiratory physicians, critical care physicians and emergency physicians. And uh, the with this uh, combined approach, there has been a significant uh, decrease in the death rate and also significant decrease in uh, uh, the more comorbid complication and bleeding risk if you are using uh, this therapy, uh, this mode of therapy in acute pulmonary embolisms which produce cardiogenic shock. So just to give you an overview, the initial treatment uh, over the five days in VT is unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin or 
thrombolysis or vitamin K endogenous or NOACs. In intermediate treatment, we use vitamin K uh, or NOACs as the first line of treatment for unprovoked PE for at least uh, three to six months, while uh, the use is extended if there is an unprovoked VT uh, and the risk factors continue or if the residual uh, thrombus is present uh, or if the patients have cancer or thrombophilia, genetic thrombophilia states. Since we continue anticoagulation for lifelong. And uh, with this, uh, I would end here and I will be happy to take uh, questions uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much. So, I agree. It's a very good uh, presentation of Dr. N. N. Khanna, along with his personal experience in Delhi. That's very interesting and enlightening, uh, because what we see in the real world practice is uh, maybe different than the randomized trial. So this is the true data in the real world practice. Now, a few. Uh, I open the session for discussion. Maybe at the end or whatever. A few comments. Yes. At the end. yes. Good idea. At the uh, end, we should just uh, yes. Yes, good idea. At the end, we'll make it at the end, huh? so we'll yes. continue the flow of the. Good yes, idea. Please.